Good evening. My name is Tom Giroux, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. Uh, and we're here uh, to present a webinar tonight. My coworker, Don Schnitzler, is here. Fictionally, we call him Schnitz. And uh, here's a little bit about our organization, including our mission, which is to inform, educate, archive, and publish. Uh, so tonight, we're going to be informing and educating uh, you about some in interesting uh, forest history. Um, if you support our mission, I encourage you to become a member of the uh, Forest History Association of Wisconsin. You can see the membership uh, link there, and uh, it's just $20 a year. And we appreciate the support, uh, particularly in helping us produce these webinars. Uh, so with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Don who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Okay, I'm also a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's Board of Directors, and I am pleased to welcome you all to tonight's presentation. And I'm excited to hear our speaker tonight talk about his father, George Banzoff. Um, the, the talk is titled Adventures of a Young Entrepreneur, George Banzoff, 1921 to 1928. And it's being presented by his son, Bill, uh, who had the opportunity to go to work for his father in 1967, or after he graduated from college, uh, the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources in 67. And he worked with his father until his father passed away. And then Bill sold the company, the George Banzoff and Company that was located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Bill then went to Washington, DC, where he was selected to be the chief executive officer for the Society of American Foresters. He left there in 2002 and became the first president of Sustainable Forestry Initiative and has since retired. Uh, since 2007, he resides at Indian Lake in the upper, upper peninsula of Michigan. Tonight, Bill is gonna talk about his dad and he's written this book in the first person uh, so he can actually get a feel for who George Banzoff was. Uh, George Banzoff was inducted into the Wisconsin Forestry Hall of Fame in September of 1986 uh, in recognition for establishing the first consulting firm in Lake States, uh, solving problems in forest industries and landowners involving timberland appraisal, uh, mill location, wood supply availability, wood procurement procedures, department organizations, and timber taxation analysis. He was a busy man. Uh, before turning the screen over to Bill and letting him fill in the blanks here and tell us more about his father, a couple of housekeeping issues. First, if you are, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, you can jot those down into the chat feature, which is located near the bottom of your screen. And Tom will make sure that's turned on so that it's working. But we will hold all questions to ask Bill until the end of the presentation. Uh, if you experience any difficulties while we're going through the prep webinar, uh, you can use that same chat feature to reach out to Tom and I, and we will see what we can do to resolve the issues as quickly as possible. And finally, the, the um, presentation is being recorded and it will be placed on the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's website and YouTube channel sometime tomorrow. And with that, I am pleased to turn this over to um, Bill, and like you, I'm eager to hear what Bill has to say tonight. Bill, this is yours, or the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Don and Tom. Uh, if I could have our slide first. I am having some difficulty here. <laughs> well, that always makes things exciting. It does. I'm going to stop share and start over here. For some reason, are you seeing it? I'm seeing it. We got it. All right. So, thanks again to both of you. I have really been looking forward to this. Uh, as Don mentioned, uh, I wrote The Adventures of a Young Entrepreneur, George Banzaff, 1921 to 1928. 
in my father's voice. Uh, it was a joy for me to do that. I worked with him for 21 years. He was an incredible mentor to me, aside from being his son. Uh, so tonight is, is a real pleasure for me. Next. Is it advancing? It is not, but as the slide is there, let me move on a bit about the book. Uh, I was fortunate enough when I decided to write it that I found that Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in their archives, had eight boxes of material describing my father's activities on a weekly basis from 1922 to 1928. That was the basis of much of the, of the book. Tonight, I am going to be focusing on the professional end of the story. I will say uh, that the book itself includes a good many personal activities of my father, uh, which you might enjoy should you wish to purchase the book at some point. And just loving having the technical problems here today. Well, that's, that's okay. Uh, being as old as I am, I continue to have technical problems. So I certainly appreciate that. As I said, he was my father, but the achievements during his 20s were remarkable. Uh, Tom, it, I am seeing the right part of the slide cut off. Is, is everyone else seeing it all or not? Don, what do you see? What's what's covering the right part of the slide was was a panel. Yeah. Thank you, Terry, for mentioning that. And it's good to see that you're on board. Look forward to talking with you. Yeah, if we could ever get this uh, resolved here. I'm gonna try resetting something here. And I actually mean, we have to go back a good bit. You wanna go back to slide? One more, yeah. Yes, there we are, and everything is perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, the, the challenges that he faced in his 20s, enduring the physical challenges of walking and working in the wilderness uh, by himself, sometimes in dangerous situations, his financial challenges that he had in investing in these new ventures over the 10-year period, and of course, the emotional challenges that went with him, uh, particularly because of the both combined physical and financial uh, work that he was doing. I think back to my own 20s, and uh, I, I can't believe my dad did all he did in, in those years. Next. In his teen years, my father read a good many novels by Stuart Edward White. Uh, that person wrote a uh, history and novels about the logging period in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in the 19th century and sort of the beginnings of, of forestry. If any of you are interested in that period, I would highly recommend Stuart Edward White as a, as a, a novel and a, an author to pursue. Uh, his father wanted him to be a, a dentist, but reading Stuart Edward White he felt that his calling was to become a forester and go out and try to bring back the forests that had been cut over uh, in the Lake States during the 19th century. He enrolled in the forestry department at the University of Michigan back in, in 1918. It was not a school, it was simply a department run by uh, a legend, Philibert Roth, and uh, Father thoroughly enjoyed his studies under Roth. He had a couple of challenges. The first was World War I. When he entered the school, the war was still going on and he felt it was appropriate to join the Student Army Corps. My father in his usual amusing fashion told me that he was certain that Kaiser Wilhelm 
surrendered based on the rumor that he had joined the Student Army Corps. The second was the Spanish flu. Uh, we are certainly familiar with, with COVID and what we've been through over the last several years, but the Spanish flu killed over 50 million people throughout the world. My dad did get the flu uh, and was put in a hospital in Ann Arbor, something that I found of particular interest and learned about my grandmother was that she left Milwaukee to travel to Ann Arbor and volunteered in the hospital in Ann Arbor to take care of those who were suffering from the Spanish flu. Uh, she put her own health at risk and for that my admiration uh, increased several fold. My dad told me that his bunkmate in the hospital late at night shared his fear that he was not going to awake in the morning. And unfortunately that turned, about, turned out to be the case. Next, the real catalyst for his adventures over the next eight to 10 years was his father, my grandfather, Henry Banzaf, who was the business manager of Marquette University in Milwaukee, as well as the founding dean of the dental school. The university had invested in the Northern Michigan Land Company. And unfortunately, that company went bankrupt and the university was left with 250,000 acres in the great north woods of the Upper Peninsula. They knew not what they had or what to do with it. So in as much as the state of Wisconsin did not have a forestry school at that time, my grandfather called the University of Michigan and spoke with Philibert Roth to ask his advice about what should be done. And Roth indicated that what was really important was to put together a survey team that could go up and really take a look at the property, find out what was there, what its potential uses might be, uh, and then prepare a report for the uh, university regents in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Next. The adventure begins when my father graduated in 1922. Next. Here is a general map of where it all happened. Uh, I called it in the book, a story map. The general area on the left, you can see most of Michigan. You'll see that number 10 is Ann Arbor where he went to school. Number one towards the top is Manistique where he started the adventure. Two, three, four, five, and six go out throughout the Upper Peninsula and are tied to partic particular stories. On the right is a more detailed map of the local area, and you can see Manistique, and then you can see such things as the Mint Farm, the Fox Farm, and the Golf Course, all of which were part of my father's adventure. Next. Well, my dad, when he graduated from Ann Arbor, uh, traveled back to Milwaukee, his hometown, and then took the Northwestern uh, train north to Pembine, where he switched to the Sioux Line, which took uh, a Pullman car over east towards Manistique. Uh, he told me that when he was looking at the Upper Peninsula from his seat in the train car, all he could see was cut over, burned over land with smoke from the residual fires in almost every horizon. When he arrived in Manistique, he was fully aware that it was a real boom town, a sawmill town, uh, dominated by a number of mills. Uh, it had a population at that time in 1922 of approximately 10,000. I live just north of Manistique now, and our population is a little over 3,500. When he arrived in Manistique, uh, he left the train, and I should say, by the way, that I miss that train. When I was a younger person, I could take the train from Milwaukee up to Manistique for the summers. And that kind of train service simply isn't available in rural areas anymore. All we have is freight. And I, I uh, as someone who was 81, I look back and I miss that. Next. From the train station, he went to the Hotel Asawinama Key, which was named after a local Ojibwe chieftain. It was where the crew was to meet. The rest of the crew had traveled up from Ann Arbor, uh, which included uh, some graduate students as well as a number of professors. When my father checked into the hotel, he uh, shared with me that it was a very cold spring day 
and he asked the desk clerk whether or not there were extra blankets in, in his room, and he was assured that he wouldn't have to worry about that because every room was insulated with sawdust. At that point, my father asked where the nearest fire escape would be to his room. Next. From Manistique, the crew put their Model T truck and Ford uh, on a uh, flat car as part of a haywire logging train, which went north to Munising with a stop at Shingleton, which was another mill town directly north of Manistique, about 35 miles. They then took both a small logging railroad as well as some of the logging two track roads east about 10 to 15 miles and set up their initial camp. You can see in this picture that the camp is part of the barren landscape with just a few pines on various upland areas. It was a, a pretty well done camp in that they had sleeping tents, they had a uh, cook tent, and you can see the interior of one of the office tents that worked as well as a sleeping tent. As an aside to that picture, uh, I want to share with you an experience that I had in my early days in the field. This was 1968, and I was doing a forest inventory in uh, Alabama for uh, George Banzav and Company. We were doing an appraisal of the uh, a large steel company property down there. And I was to call the office about every other day and share with my dad the progress we were making in terms of the acres covered, the percentage of the project completed, et cetera. And my dad said, well, well son, uh, how was your day today? And I have to admit that there may have been a little whining involved in my response in that I said, well, dad, uh, I spent most of the day in, up to my knees in water, and every time I looked around, there was another water moccasin. Bugs were everywhere, and it was close to 100 degrees, so it was a really tough day. And my dad paused and said, That's, that is tough, son. Uh, how, how's your hotel room? And I said, well, my hotel room is fine. He said, the, the shower works all right? And I said, oh, sure, sure, it's working. He said, how about your color TV? Is that working? And I said, Dad, and he said, I don't want to hear another word from you about how tough things are. I was under a canvas tent from May until October, and that kind of put me in my place, and my own reality came to be. So next. This is another picture of the kind of country that was in the 1920s of the Upper Peninsula, mostly cut over with some stands of pine on dry areas, some that were missed by the loggers, uh, but it was a barren country. Next. Here's a picture of my dad with his staff compass uh, looking incredibly young. Uh, I, 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 I wish I had that hat now, but uh, I do not, unfortunately. In any event, I, he was incredibly proud of his field skills. Uh, he had to have a great deal of confidence to be working on his own in some relatively dangerous country. But uh, I want to read a section of the book, and I'm going to do this on three different occasions. And once again, as was said, this is in his voice. So you get a sense of how he might have felt uh, working in the woods. The first week of my field work was highlighted by an event that, though based on luck, left me with a great deal of pride about my field skills. Thanks to the 1856 survey of William Burt, I was able to accurately start my compass line at the southeast corner of section 36. From that corner, I was to walk one mile north to the northeast corner of section 36. I had a double pace of six feet, so there were 11 paces to a chain, 66 feet, and 80 chains to a mile. The term chain comes from the early surveying work where a 66 foot chain was used to measure distance. As I started my pacing due north, I hoped I would continue to find additional quarter corners every 20 chains marked by Bert. I was able to confirm his field notes, which stated that the country was flat and wet with tree species composed primarily of tamarack, alder, and the occasional islands of pine. There was very little timber on my compass line, but after a half a mile, I ran into a small stand of white pine on the edge of a swamp. 
After some practice, I had, been, I had a pretty good eye for judging a tree's diameter at breast height, or DBH. The second measurement in order to calculate the timber volume was height. I used an Abney level, developed in England by a surveying engineer to get a good estimate. With these two variables and the application of some geometry, I could accurately determine the volume of lumber per acre of the stand I was sampling. Then, back at camp, I used those measurements and the acreage of the stand to generate the total volume. In addition to timber estimates, I would include the soil types. In the case of peat, I also measured the depth of the soil. As I continued on my compass line, I began to look for the section corner, the northeast corner of section 36, exactly one mile from my starting point. After 80 chains or one mile, I had yet to see a post set by Burke marking a quarter corner. This was a concern because the ownership line was two miles out from my starting point and I needed to make certain my mapping and timber measurements were on the Marquette property. I completed my pacing to where the corner should be and stopped. I had been estimating my progress by keeping track of each chain or 11 paces with a small tally meter looped over my wrist by a leather strap. By the way, I have that tally meter. I hoped that I would be near the corner marker. As I checked my compass to continue the line, my right foot came down directly on the marker set by Burke 60 years earlier. Clearly, I was a cruiser and mapper extraordinaire. Truth be told, I was just lucky. It was a matter of compensating errors over the one mile of pacing. Nevertheless, I felt pretty good about it. Next. Here are two pictures of the kind of uh, uh, environment in which they were working. On the right is a professor who, uh, University of Michigan, who was part of the field crew. And on the left is my father walking on a plank bridge that they had set over some of the deeper wet areas. Excuse me for a moment. Uh, the crew itself had a phrase that if our feet were dry, we were off the ownership. And my dad told me that that was normally the case. You might be interested to know that a good portion of this property was acquired for the Senior Wildlife Refuge in uh, North Central UP. One of the things that my dad had told me was that he was not happy with the policy of people working alone in the woods. He went along with it because that's the way things went during those times. Uh, but he always felt that working in wilderness, and particularly in wetland areas where you could fall and hurt yourself, it wasn't a sound policy. And I know when I started working with him in 1967, all of our field work was done by two-person crews, particularly in the winter, uh, where you were on snowshoes with other possibilities for accidents. I want to read another section of the book which deals with this issue. With one week remaining before we were to break camp, I headed out to one of my last survey lines within the section I was cruising. The weather had turned cold. Some of the streams had a thin layer of ice on their surface. The temperature the previous night had dropped to an unusual 20 degrees. My line heading north had been uneventful with some black spruce and tamarack stands interspersed with the ubiquitous marshlands. Going south, I ran into a large stand of white pine on an island. By the time I had finished the several plots needed to estimate the pine volume, it was late in the afternoon. A mixture of wet snow and rain began to fall. I was looking forward to sitting in front of the cooking stove as John Jewell prepared dinner for the crew. The previous evening, he had served porcupine pie, thanks to the shooting skills of our handyman, Carol Clark, and I hoped there might be leftovers. I am certain that my Milwaukee friends would cringe at the thought of eating porcupine, but it was amazingly tender with a slight hint of sweetness. As I was walk working my way south, I came across a stream about five feet wide. I knew that with a short run, I could jump across the creek and save myself an hour walking to the planks we had set as a bridge. After a short run, I got to the edge to make what was a relatively easy jump. At that point, I slipped on the bank and landed face first in some very cold water. As I stood up to walk to the opposite bank, both of my feet sank three feet down in the muck bottom. Outside of polite company, we called this muck loon shit. 
I was in real trouble. My legs were set in the mud as if I had walked into a three foot hole filled with fresh cement. Although I was stable for the moment, I knew that soon my legs would go numb from the ice cold water and mud. I also knew that in another 30 minutes, I wouldn't have the strength to move. And that would be the end of George Banzaf and any subsequent generation should I be lucky enough to meet the right girl. With very little energy left, I saw that there was a limb from some tag alder that was leaning towards me from the opposite bank. I knew that if I lunged to reach it and missed, I was finished. What I had feared for all of us from the first day of our field season had happened to me. I had been in too much of a hurry to get back to camp and now had paid the price. I always felt alone during my days of mapping, but this was a very different kind of alone. The sky had recently cleared, and I looked at the darkening blue hue seen just before sunset. Venus had risen, and the beauty of the evening was all around me. This was not what I should be thinking. I feared the cold water and my frozen legs had my mind drifting away from my reality. I was facing death. There could be no more thinking about what I should do. There was no other option. With all the remaining strength I had, I threw my body forward towards the tag alder. I could feel the muck holding me in place, but I was able to grab the end of the branch with my outstretched right hand. I still wasn't out of the woods, pun intended. It took me a good 15 minutes to pull myself free. I was freezing, but I was alive. I walked the half mile back to camp in the warm cook stove with great purpose and thankfulness, realizing just how lucky I had been. And I would say that I was lucky as well, since if he had not made that, I wouldn't be here today. Next, on a lighter note, uh, Russell Watson was part of the crew and became a good friend of my father. He was an associate professor at the University of Michigan, a bit older than my dad, but they became uh, working comrades. And at one point had to do a two, two day walk from the shores of Lake Michigan all the way up to the shores of Lake Superior, straight across the UP in order to take a look at some of the land owned by Marquette University. On their second day, they heard a roar to their east and decided to abandon their compass line and investigate. Well, lo and behold, what they saw was Taquamanon Falls, uh, a real pleasant and wonderful surprise for them. Obviously, it had, it had been mapped earlier. They had not discovered it, but they were some of the first people, other than Native Americans, to see the, the, the lar second largest falls east of the Mississippi River. Next. I wanna talk a little bit about how they moved their camp. Here's a picture of Russ Watson as a young man and the Model T Ford with some of the camping gear. Next. You can see here the, the Model T Ford truck on a flat car, uh, you'll notice that uh, it had chains in the rear wheels, which made it an excellent woods car. They moved their vehicles either by the two tracks or on flat cars to their various camps across the UP. My dad always said that the Model T Ford was the very best woods car ever designed. And having had a great deal of experience with four wheel drive vehicles, I have to say that I agree with him. Because when you get stuck in a four-wheel drive vehicle, you are really stuck, and it normally takes the rest of the day to get unstuck. Whereas if you'd been in a two-wheel drive vehicle with a little bit more judgment, you would have accomplished more in the day. Next. During their time of working together, both Russ Watson and my father would continue to comment on the barren nature of the land in which they were working with very little tree cover, lots of burned over areas, soil degradation. And it was their strong belief that owners of the land, whether they be Market University, whether they be the government, the forest products industry, or other private landowners, they would need advice in terms of how to use good forestry to return these lands to a productive forest cover. So based on that desire, they started one of the very first forestry consulting firms in the United States. It was actually, I think, one of three in the United States, and it was the very first in the Great Lakes. 
uh, they, their firm was very successful working with landowners as well as managing lands and harvesting timber uh, on a sustainable basis. In the 30s, uh, through some disagreement, though my dad and Russ Watson uh, remained good friends, I knew Russ as a young boy, uh, dad created his own consulting business, George Banzaff and Company. Next. During one of their meetings with um, Mr. Joe Herbert, Joseph Herbert was an attorney living in Manistique who was working with Marquette University on much of the title work involving their 250,000 acres. And he had gotten to know my dad and Russ Watson well. He was a man who eventually became a regent at the University of Michigan, a very successful attorney. And he was also a golfer. And he was aware that in the middle 1920s, golfing was a, a boom business and there were golf courses being started all over the country. If any of you watching this evening are golfers and know a little bit about some of the more famous golf courses around, you'd notice that they were built in the 20s, many of them. So uh, Russ Watson and my dad were listening to, to Joe Herbert as he explained that there was a real opportunity to move forward with an exciting venture. The Chicago Lumber Company was offering for sale some 220 acres, including 4,700 front feet of Indian Lake frontage and a 60 acre pasture that they had used for uh, summer grazing of their winter logging horses. Previous to the Chicago Lumber Company, it was uh, land of the Ojibwe tribe. They were interested in selling it, and Joe Herbert thought there might be a real opportunity here, not only to build a golf course, but since there was so much Indian Lake frontage to perhaps develop a second home uh, area for people to build their cabins. He asked my father and Russ to go out and take a look at the property, which they did. And uh, they came back to Joe and indicated that they thought too that this would be a fantastic opportunity whereupon the three of them went to uh, one of the Manistique banks and borrowed close to $40,000 to start this venture. Next. Here is the woodlands that surrounded the pasture that became the golf course. As you can read, it had some 1 million feet of timber, mostly beech, birch, and hard maple with some elm and hemlock. Uh, most of that forest is gone now. Uh, a lot of it went in the last 10 to 15 years where uh, we had a great deal of development, um, actually, particularly during, during COVID. And most of that forest is gone now. Uh, I would say that my father's dream of a developed second home area has come to reality. But honestly, I miss those woods that I played in as a young man and enjoyed when we first retired up here. Next. Here is a picture of some of the frontage on Indian Lake. Uh, this was taken in 1927. This is actually the cove where my dad built uh, a small summer cabin in 1927, 28, which is now the home to my spouse and I. Uh, we retired here after making a year round residence in 2007. Uh, Indian Lake is a beautiful lake and we are fortunate that my dad had the foresight to do this kind of thing. Next. Here is a picture just after the course opened. It's simply a small nine hole course put together on a, on a, a pasture that was set right next to Indian Lake. You can see Indian Lake is right on the, uh, on the horizon there with the tree line. It was uh, a course that was uh, new to the area, obviously. Next. But through early marketing and real development along Indian Lake, it became very successful. Uh, Aeroid Inn was built on the shores of Indian Lake just south of the golf course, uh, as well as Hubby's Lodge. The Aeroid Inn uh, that had a wonderful restaurant uh, is no longer there, but Hubby's uh, Bear Trap Lodge still exists with its cottages. Uh, so the course became very well supported by both local residents as members, as well as tourists paying greens fees. 
Next. Here is a plaque that's on the present day clubhouse, which pretty much describes the transfer uh, to my dad, Joe Herbert and Russ Watson, how the course was designed by John Barr uh, and eventually was purchased in the late 40s, early 50s uh, by the membership at large. Next. Here is a present day picture of part of the front nine of the golf course. Uh, it is in terrific shape. It's now viewed as one of the very best courses in the Upper Peninsula. And if any of you come by Manistique and enjoy golf, I would urge you to come and play. Uh, our house is located just on the lake, right at the corner of the golf course. Next. A big part of the work that the crew from the University of Michigan was doing for Market University was the identification based on the forest survey of potential land uses that would be of value to Marquette University. And what they found initially was that mint farming was becoming a real boom industry. Uh, the market was primarily to the, the pharmaceutical industry as well as to Wrigley's. Uh, so they identified a property next that they felt was suitable for planting mint. What they did was survey the property, laid out where they thought the appropriate drainage dishes, ditches should be to run into a big ditch. Uh, and I should say that that big ditch is still there. The rest of the property has, has grown over and was abandoned, but the big ditch is still there and runs into Indian Lake. They then, once they'd done this surveying and had the plan of action ready, they contacted a dredging firm in Chicago and a large wooden A-frame dredger was brought up on a rail car from Chicago to the site. Next. Here's a picture of that A-frame dredger. You can see it's made of wood uh, and, and did the job that was necessary. Next. Here you can see uh, the work of the dredger and how the water was able to flow out of that lowland. And the result was property that was suitable for planting mint. And the next slide, please. You will see uh, a, a large field filled with mint uh, and a picture of Everett Wood, who was the farm superintendent. He worked for my father, who was the overall manager of the mint. Uh, the mint farm lasted until the late 20s. They had a uh, a small factory that would create mint oil. And then that mint oil was shipped to the various markets. Next. One of the other things that they felt might be of interest to Marquette University was farming for silver fox. Uh, silver fox was a very valued fur and fur was a big part of the fashion industry of the day. It certainly isn't anymore, but it was then. And my dad found a property that was suitable and made a plan and made a presentation with his father, who was business manager of Marquette, to the regents. The regents of Marquette University felt that the mint farm was something they wanted, the fox farm, not so much. They had no interest in doing that. My dad and my grandfather were both very disappointed. So they talked it over, had several meetings, and decided that if Marquette University wasn't interested, they would find some land and they would start a fox farm themselves, which is what they did. They found a piece of property uh, just about four miles north of Manistique, where they set up fox pens. You can see left the, the pens, and that's probably one-tenth of the area that was covered by fox pens. And on the right, the dual pens uh, for uh, for the fox, it's the silver fox. Next. My father had gone both to New York on a previous trip before they decided to, to do uh, this new venture and met with fur buyers to determine what markets were available. He also met with a, a very successful fox farmer in Southern Wisconsin and learned that uh, one needed to make certain that the fox 
pens were, were clean and were safe and that the foxes were fed with nutritious food. The food that was decided was a mixture of uh, grain and horse meat. And my dad had uh, on a regular basis, very old horses that were about to be put down, brought to the slaughterhouse that was located at the fox farm to be made into the horse meat. One day, and he shared this story with me, uh, he was sitting in his office at the fox farm. Once again, you're talking about a young man in his 20s. And uh, he was talking to a fur buyer from New York. Well, he heard a couple of pistol shots outside of his office, but he was aware that that was where the slaughterhouse was. As he was about to explain that to a somewhat nervous fur buyer, one Snooze Taylor, who was truly a legend and would, would uh, uh, warrant an entire separate book, came in stripped to, the stripped to the waist, covered in horse blood with a smoking revolver in one hand and a gutting knife in his other. And before my father could utter a word, the fur, bar the, the fur buyer ran out, got into his car and drove quickly to Manistique to report what he was sure would be a homicide. Uh, my father was able to call the police and let them know what had happened, that all was well. But uh, unfortunately, the fur buyer would not return and future negotiations were done by telephone. Next. Here's a picture of the crew with their harvest. Uh, you look at that these days and it's somewhat grisly, but fur was a, a, a very valuable commodity in those days. The Fox Farm was successful throughout the 40s. In the late 1940s, when the fashion market changed more towards mink and actually away from fur entirely, uh, the, the, they closed the Fox Farm and that venture died. Next. My father always told me, uh, and being a part of a small consulting firm with him for 20 years, I was aware of this, that in any new venture, there is always risk. And I want to read another section, the last thing I'll read from the book, uh, the remainder of the book, if you want to read it, hopefully you will purchase it from the, the Forest History Association. My dad was having breakfast with his father, and this tells that particular story. After the waiter had placed our breakfast on the table, dad looked at me with a very serious expression and said that he had a real concern he wanted to discuss with me. As he had done on many previous occasions, he expressed his pride in the achievements I had made in the very short span of time since I graduated from the University of Michigan in 1922. I had shown leadership and self-motivation in helping to conduct the survey of 250,000 acres owned by Marquette University. I had literally walked into the wilderness, spending many days by myself in wild and somewhat dangerous country, mapping forests and marshlands in order to develop a plan of action for their management. I had been instrumental in establishing and in managing a mint farm north of Manistique. This involved a massive dredging exercise to the extent that it changed the very nature of the land upon which mint was to be grown. During the same time, I had joined with Russell Watson in the creation of a forestry consulting firm, one of the first of its kind in the United States. Dad did not need to remind me that he had invested $5,000 to facilitate the startup of this new firm. As he said, it was not long thereafter that I formed a partnership with Joe Herbert in order to develop a golf course and the surrounding lakeshore. That last venture required that Joe and I obtain a mortgage of over $30,000 from a local Manistique bank. Now with his financial support, I was to begin the development of a fox farm, a significant financial risk. He reminded me, however, that a major component of this success rested on my acceptance of significant debt load by the age of 26. He understood that this was a part and parcel of the incredible economic growth seen throughout the country since the end of World War I. His concern for me reflected his strong belief and experience that the economy went in cycles and that the current period of prosperity would not last forever. A downturn in business could certainly occur in the near future. He did not feel comfortable that I was saddled with so much debt 
and now desiring to become even more stretched financially with the construction of a fox farm. Did I understand that being in debt could also limit my flexibility should another opportunity, perhaps a job with the Forest Service, come to my attention? I told him that I understood and that I appreciated his concerns, but the joy I found in my life was centered around the excitement I felt every time I began a new venture. I wanted to make a real difference in the world. Ironically, several months after that breakfast with his father, my dad was approached in Milwaukee by none other than Aldo Leopold, who was then managing the Forest Products Lab for the US Forest Service in Madison. And Mr. Leopold asked my dad if he would join the lab and be their liaison for their forest products industry, since he knew of my dad's contacts with that industry. My father had to decline that wonderful offer, indicating that two things, one, he had ventures that he needed to, to take care of and move forward in their, their to, to reach their success, and that he was under consi a considerable debt load and could not do that. So what his father had told him came to be true. Next. This is what I call an epilogue uh, of the life of an entrepreneur. And this will kind of bring you up to at least the 1980s. Uh, in 1928, my dad uh, was in debt for $39,000 in total, which if you convert that to, days, to today's dollars, that's close to $700,000. He felt the economy was going to maintain its strength. We all know that in 1929, the stock market crashed. Uh, he was obviously in dire straits. He was able to eke out a living and maintain some of his debt load through the work that he and Russell Watson did in their consulting business and the subsequent work that he did in his consulting practice, George Banzaff and Company. But uh, though he was able to do pretty well, he no longer felt he could handle that kind of debt load. And in 1946, he sold his share of all the land of the golf course and lakeshore properties, which eliminated his debt by 1946. Things were looking really good for my dad. He had built a very successful sawmill in Marquette, Michigan, uh, to convert the logs that he was getting from his managed properties and was making a good living. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the sawmill caught fire. He went to the telephone to try to call the fire department and realized when the telephone operators told him quite clearly that they were on strike and would in no way connect him to the fire department. The result was a total disaster for the mill. It burned to the ground and he was let, left with approximately $300,000 in debt in 1949. Uh, most of that to the Marshall Illesley Bank in Milwaukee. Uh, he went back to Milwaukee because he had an office there as well uh, and went to talk with Mr. Puliker, who was the president of the Marshall Illesley Bank. Puliker and my father had both a business relationship and it also developed a strong personal relationship. And Mr. Puliker told my dad that, look, George, uh, I know this is totally against my own interests as president of the Marshall and Isley Bank, but I suggest that you declare bankruptcy. I do not want you carrying this kind of debt load for the rest of your life. You're too good a friend and the bank will survive. So please declare bankruptcy. My father looked at him and said, Mr. Puliker, uh, Joe was his name, is Joe. You lent me that money in good faith, and I'm going to pay it back in good faith if you'll give me time. And Mr. Peterker said, if that's what you want, uh, that's what we'll do, and we'll give you as much time as you need. In the 1950s, George Banzam and Company evolved from a land management sawmilling organization to one of the most highly successful North American forestry consulting firms in the country. Uh, one of their largest uh, projects was actually for a congressional commission, the Public Land Law Review Commission, where George Banzaff and company with a study team of some very uh, uh, 
well-qualified academicians from University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, and University of Minnesota prepared a study that reviewed forest management on all federal lands in the United States. That includes the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, any federal lands where forestry was managed, that was part of the study uh, and it was well received. During my time uh, there, and as I said, I started working with my dad in 1967, uh, we appraised over 30 million acres of forest products industry land for the various mergers and acquisitions that were going on during that time. Uh, another big portion, uh, and Don mentioned this, uh, the business was assessing sustainable supply chains for the forest products industry. Based on wood supply studies, we were able to locate several pulp and paper, pulp and paper mills and sawmilling facilities throughout the late states and the southeast. In 1983, uh, with a number of years of success in this consulting business, I joined my father and walked with a great deal of pride and uh, a considerable amount of emotion, I can tell you. And we walked over and walked into the office of Mr. Pulicker. It was actually Mr. Pulicker's son, who was now president of the MI, and paid off those debts. Uh, I think that aside from the energy and, and creativity that my father had in being the entrepreneur that he was throughout his life, Paying off his debts uh, shows the kind of person and man he was. He was a man of real character. And I was really, really lucky to have him as my father. So for that, uh, I'm happy to, uh, I don't know if the next slide talks about the book, but I'm also happy to go into a, 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 a question period. Um, I will tell you once again that I've only read three small portions of the book. A good bit of it deals with my pop, my father's personal life and even his meeting of the right girl, in quotes, who came became my mother. So I think it's a, I'm, I'm proud of it. Uh, as I said before, I loved writing it, writing it in his voice. And since I donated all of the copies, all of the money will go directly to the Forest History Association to support their continued good work. So with that, I am certainly open to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I was a fascinating story. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, start uh, looking at some of the questions here in the chat. Okay, from John Grossman. We know John. I do know John. The fact that your dad responding to your expressed interest in becoming a forester said you had to get a liberal arts degree first to enable you to connect with the people as a forester. Can you talk a little bit about the requirement and what it meant uh, to your view of the profession and, and your life in retrospect? Absolutely, I'd be happy to, and it, I think it reflected his wisdom. I didn't know it at the time, but it sure did. I wanted to be a forester and more specifically to work with my father. I, I have a feeling to be honest, if he'd been in used cars, I would have wanted to join him there, but he was a forester and I, I always loved the outdoors. So I told him as I was entering my senior year in high school that I wanted to go to the University of Michigan and go into forestry. And he said, no, you're not gonna do that. If you're gonna work for me, I want you to get a liberal arts education first. Forestry can be very narrow. Uh, his own education, he felt, was narrow. He was a Renaissance man in that he read uh, almost everything he could get his hands on. And he believed that a liberal arts education would give me uh, a better understanding of the worldview, how to work with people, how to lead people, and uh, also how to write and express myself in as much as the product of George Banzaff and Company was a written report. So after uh, getting my undergraduate degree in history, political science and literature at the University of Colorado, I then said, well, dad, I'm ready to go to forestry school. And he said, and this goes beyond what you said, John. He said, no, no, not yet, son. I want you to work for somebody else. I don't believe that son should go to work for their fathers as the first job. Fathers and sons don't always work out. I want you to try something else. So I did what every history major does. I sold newspaper advertising for, for about a year. 
And after that, my father encouraged me and I went to the University of Michigan and the rest is, you know. Hey, John's going to be dominating our questions here. I know he's fascinated with the story, he's read the book. So the area in which George Banzoff began his career is very close to the origins of forestry as a profession in the U.S. Much energy was put into a government uh, regulated profession on public land. Much of the activity of the forested lands involved simple exploitation to meet a need for a growing country moving west. What drove this man to engage in private sector approach to the profession of forestry? Well, I think to some extent, John, it was that very fact that uh, initially the forest practice industry was primarily exploitive. Uh, and my father, as did Russ Watson, but certainly my father throughout his career, felt that it was in the long-term interest of the forest products industry with their multi-million dollar mills to have a sustainable forest management operation. And that's what he pushed. And when he did wood supply studies for mills, it was always based on an allowable cut, whether it be from public lands or private lands. So that really is what led him to work with industry and try to bring around the reform that I think you see now. I mean, my career ended uh, as the CEO of a forest certification organization. So the forest products industry, uh, most of that land is now certified. So you can see the full evolution. Okay, we're just gonna continue with John here. We have a different questionnaire coming up, so that's good. In the evolution of forestry over your time in the profession, uh, private practice to management of the professional society, an organization of 20,000 members uh, to something now close to half that, uh, to the implementation of sustainable forestry initiative, what would your dad think about the change over the past 100 years? Well, uh... I, I think he would understand it, and I think that he would approve of it. Um, when I, every day I think that the world is changing so fast, I think back to my dad, who was born as electricity was coming around to cities, was born at the start of the automobile, was born at the start of the airplane, went through two world wars and a depression, witnessed the atomic bomb, and uh, someone landing in the moon. So he was very used to change, and I think he would have really approved of it. I think his sadness uh, would have joined mine that SAF has been reduced in size because the organization, and I am a strong supporter and a lifelong golden member, the organization is focused more on, on forestry and not the total ecosystems that are involved in natural forests. And I think that to some extent is why the membership has gone down, but it is a viable organization now and doing well, which I'm happy about. Okay, something from Samuel Radcliffe. Bill, you didn't mention that your father was a remarkable storyteller. And in the book, you captured his voice perfectly. So maybe talk about his storytelling. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, it's good to have you on board here tonight. Uh, and and um, I have to, to thank Sam uh, for something in as much as he took over the firm as president when I left George Brands having company to go to, to DC. And if he had not been willing to do that, I would not have been in that position. So I've always been thankful for that. Uh, I, there are some stories that I'm, I'm just trying to thank Sam of some of the stories that, that he told me. Uh, I, I know one involved uh, his going to one of his logging camps where the uh, logging boss had walked off with the payroll. And my father, uh, actually through reading some of Stuart Edward White books, felt that the answer to solving that, since he didn't have much money at that point, the payroll was gone, he was going to develop his own script. He was going to prepare his own money. Kimberly Clark owed him $30,000 for pulpwood he had delivered and was soon to pay him within hopefully 30 days. So he printed his own money. He went up to the logging camp and to all the local grocery stores and small towns 
indicating that this money was, was valuable, that they should accept it. They would send it down to the Marshall Lindsay Bank where they would get their cash and things would be fine. And so he distributed that money and then went back to Milwaukee and prayed that Kimberly Clark would deliver the $30,000 or he would go to jail. So that's just another one of my, my father's stories and he was wonderful at telling them. All right, uh, John, uh, Don, you can check me out, but I think we've answered all the questions. I believe so. Uh, but just to piggyback on Sam's comment, listening to you tonight, Bill, your dad was a remarkable man and it makes me eager to read the book uh, that you're by the way, By the way, Don, that phrase, he was a remarkable man is on his tombstone. Very cool. So anyway, thank you, Bill. It was an excellent presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm eager to read the book. And, and on this slide that's up right now is the information. If someone wants to order the book, they can send a check to the Forest History Association for $20. The book is $14.95 plus $5 postage, and we'll get that back and ship it out to you right away. So I think it should be a good book to read. Um, Next, I, I just to mention, uh, next month we're going to have a presentation. It's actually like our pre-conference webinar, and it will be presented by Eric. Um, let me think here. I have to find it. Eric Reinert, and he is the historian for the Corps of Engineers at the headquarters of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and he's going to be talking about. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Wisconsin, specifically talking about civil works projects that the U.S. Army was involved in for the last 200 years. And so that information will be going up on our website in the next couple of days, and registration information will be available there. So if someone wants to register for next month's webinar, they can start doing that. And there'll also be notices coming out to everyone. There is also uh, uh, on the screen right now a flyer from our upcoming conference in October 5th and uh, 6th and 7th. We have uh, the fall conference. It's going to be held at Toma, Wisconsin, and it's on the military's role in Wisconsin forest history. Uh, it, it, it's shaped up to be a really good conference. There's good speakers, a lot of good information. Uh, the highlight on Saturday are the tours. Uh, to Camp McCoy, uh, you'll have a chance to look at uh, POW uh, work area, uh, CCC camp excavation sites, and then the prisoner of war camps, and also the commemorative area at Fort McCoy. And then on Friday, the day before, and Tom, can you slide that up or? On the day before Friday, uh, there are lectures from you know, about nine o'clock in the morning until uh, 4.45, and then uh, a, a dinner with a performance by the Ho-Chunk Iron Mound sing Singers. So it's going to be a busy day, but it's got a lot of good information. I would encourage anyone that's interested in joining us to, to fill out the registration form and get that in. And it is open to the public. So if you're not a member of the Forest History Association, you'd like to be, or if you'd like to attend, just uh, fill out the registration as a non-member, and those people who join the conference as a non-member will be given a membership for one year to the Forest History Association also. So, and then the, the last thing is, again, um, thank you, Bill, and tomorrow you'll be getting a, a little brief survey. It may pop up as soon as you're done with the uh, sign out of the webinar tonight. There are seven questions and we'd appreciate it if you would just uh, let us know what you think about the webinar, things that we can do to improve it. If you have suggestions about future webinars, uh, just take the time to fill in or answer those seven questions. And again, I appreciate everybody's time tonight. Bill, thank you for a great presentation. My and pleasure, that, it was a real great opportunity for me. Thanks again for having me. No, you, you, Anytime you want to talk, you're more than welcome. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And thank you, uh, Tom, for making this work so smoothly. So I'm glad we got through our technical issues in the beginning there. So thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.